So today has been yet another, um, what's the word for it? Uh, rapture. Rapture. It's been yet another rapture for the games industry because 900 people have just been laid off. And so this is a list of the well-known studios and companies that have cut employees. So this is collectively all of them. But just today, this happened just today, PlayStation laid off 900 people. Which, in my opinion, is pretty fucking crazy. Yeah, 900 people got laid off. Yeah, and I'll give you an example of kind of like what happened. So this is what the employees thought. So five days ago, uh, this girl uh, had Jim Ryan, who is the, uh, I, I guess, the, what is this, the PlayStation chief uh, at, their, at their studio. This is the London studio for PlayStation. And he showed up uh, five days ago, and then she posted a tweet. Oh, bye. Thank you very much for coming. Just generally very positive. And then today he shut down their entire fucking studio and the entire thing is gone. Uh, it's completely deleted. Uh, it's removed and she replies again from the tweet, I have nothing to say. Yes, this is the Grim Reaper right here. PlayStation fanboys and shambles? Um, I think this kind of stuff only really matters to an actual, like, a, a, a like somebody who's, like, buying products and stuff like that. Whenever it negatively affects the, uh, oh yeah, yeah, by the way, yeah, here it is. Um, yeah, PlayStation Studios London Studio will close in its entirety. I love how they just kind of, like, add that in there. Like, hey, yeah, by the way, we're shutting down this entire fucking studio. So why are they doing this? I think that there could be a lot of reasons why. Uh, difficult news about our workplace. We'll listen to what they said about it. Uh, we are cutting an 8%. Which is, like, I feel like 8% is such a huge fucking number, man. 8% is massive. Like, you're talking about, like, that's almost every one in ten people is getting deleted. That is crazy. Especially for a company that size. Yeah, you're right. I don't see Pfizer cutting anybody. Uh, things make you go, hmm? Well, the reason why you probably don't see Pfizer cutting anybody is because we're not really following that kind of news. Maybe they are also are cutting people. I'm not sure. But, like, you know, I primarily follow gaming and tech news here. So, like, they do vaccines and, like, medical stuff. So... Yeah, I, I don't know about that. 8% is typical for co uh, companies? Yeah, yeah. Everyone's doing slow cuts? Yeah, it's massive. We're saying goodbye to colleagues that we cherish. If we cherish them, you wouldn't let them go. Well, here's really what's going to happen. And I think this is going to continue happening, and it's going to keep getting... Uh, I think it's going to keep getting worse. Is that you're going to see these development studios realizing that there are more things that they can automate and different functionalities that require less work overall from these companies. And because of that, they're not going to need as many people and they're going to remove them. That's it. And we see the positions that were laid off. I think it's mostly customer service. Um, I think an entire studio isn't going to be customer service, you know? Yeah, I, I feel like that's kind of unlikely. They hired too much during the pandemic and they're trimming the fat. Yeah, I think that's definitely true, too. Yeah, absolutely. What games has London Studio done anyways? Well, I'm not sure. I'd have to look into it and see for myself. People always talk about bubbles, and they think that video games just had a very weird bubble in the past 15 years. I think that video games had a... I think tech had a really weird bubble because of COVID. And I think that a lot of these companies just irresponsibly overhired. And they overhired, and then after the market stabilized after COVID... A lot of them didn't need all these people. You're seeing all of these technological advances that are happening super fast. You put all these things together, and before you know it, you don't need to have 900 extra people in your fucking company. That's really the reason. They knew exactly what they were doing? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not saying that... It's, it's hard to say, like, is the company right or wrong? I don't think it really matters. Like, companies do not exist to be in service of right or wrong. They exist to make money. Like, should it be illegal to fire people? I mean, I don't know. It depends on what the situation is. But overall, if a company can do this, a company will do this. And I think that the larger the company is, the more of a guarantee that you have with something like that. You're probably not going to see it with a studio like Larian, because Larian's a much smaller place. But with a large studio like PlayStation or Sony, then yeah, you're probably going to see a lot more of it. That's definitely it. Regardless of being right or wrong, it still got laid off. Yeah. 
I'm not surprised. Big studios still can't talk, uh, st can't, uh, can't stop taking big L's. I don't think that they're really taking big L's with this necessarily. I think that all the time people get very upset seeing this kind of stuff happen. And that's definitely true. It really sucks to see people lose their job in this way. But at the end of the day, I don't think that a lot of the actual, like, gamers care about this to the extent that they don't feel like it affects their, uh, their, their service. So, like, if they're not actually, like, losing their service and they're able to still get the games and play the games the same that they used to, I don't think they're really going to matter. I've seen a community managers that got impacted by this. Yeah, now with the new uh, hiring processes, they pull talent uh, is a lot smaller because the talent pool you have to hire from before you could hire based on skill. Now you have to select from a pool of certain classes or groups. Oh, you're talking about like the diversity stuff? I, I don't know how like realistic that is. Did they talk about during uh, the, the five days he knew it was closing? Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. I have no fucking idea. On the topic of crappy console companies, uh, do you mind checking the Mudahar video on Nintendo? Yeah, I saw that already. I, I will look at the Nintendo thing. Because, yeah, Nintendo's also shutting down, like, a very big emulator. Uh, I've noticed that before. I was a diversity hire, and uh, it's real as fuck. Oh, I'm sure with some people it is. I mean, it's one of those things that I don't really know how common something like that is because it's probably over and also underrepresented based off of people's agenda. So I don't really know how common it, it really is. But I would be very skeptical listening to somebody who thinks that they have, like, definitive proof on it. So, yeah. And people whining about delusion beyond value with actually what they do for the company. Well, I think that, like, so this is, this is my perspective on it, right? Is that I totally empathize and sympathize with the way that people feel whenever they get removed or fired from a company or laid off. I think that really sucks, like, personally. But I also don't necessarily blame the company for doing it. Because companies exist to make money. They don't exist to provide an income for people. Uh, other than, of course, what is legally required. So beyond what is legally required, you can never really expect a company to do that. And I think the more that you do expect companies to do that, the more frustrated and angry you're going to be. So, yeah, I mean, I, I totally, like, I empathize with them. Absolutely. It's horrible that this happens. But I also totally understand it, and I think it's completely reasonable. Uh, and I think that you've seen, like, technology, for example, take over a lot of different types of jobs. Like what I was talking about with the McDonald's, for example. Uh, that's just one thing. Uh, your take on this can be taken in that context again. He doesn't care, again, this time about toward ga fired game devs as long as he can play his game. Well, I, I think that, yeah, that's basically true. Like... In a world with a limited amount of empathy and care in terms of action, how could I make a decision of, like, I'm going to, like, protest playing these video games, but I'm okay with things that are made from, like, exploitative labor in, you know, like, third and second world countries? I think, like, in terms of a tier list, getting fired from a big game studio whenever you live in a first world country because you were being paid like a very high wage in, in a lot of cases, right? Or not very high wage, but you were paying, you were being paid a livable wage. Um, I, I don't really think this is very high on the tier list of uh, bad, bad ethics, especially in like the grand scheme of things in terms of like actionable things. So yeah, it's very small. Yeah, it is, it is very small. And I also think that like that is the reality of people's behavior. Now, maybe I'm going to be proven wrong, but I think that, for example, the reason why the like, a lot of the allegations and bad stuff about Blizzard, I think the reason why that stuff affected Blizzard so much is because Blizzard games were bad. And so this was really just something that made something that was bad worse. I think that, like, bad PR can make something bad worse, but I don't think it can make something good bad, if that makes sense. It's not going to make people stop consuming a product if they're getting a value out of the product. Does the success of Power World have influenced this? I do think also, like, a lot of these companies are probably rethinking because this is also like a bigger thing with video games, and it's a big problem with games, is that right now, a lot of these big studios are trying to make these blockbuster video games. Everybody wants to make the next Skyrim, or the next Witcher 3, or the next Cyberpunk 2077, uh, at least now with like all the updates and everything, or, you know, the next, you know, some other like really big game. So... Uh, Dark Souls Marcus over Saturated. Well, yeah, you have like these really, really big games. And so you have something like, like how many like blockbuster video games, like besides Suicide Squad? Like we all know Suicide Squad is one of those massive games. In the last two years, 
Let's get some names of these massive, like, 50 to 100 million plus dollar games that totally went into the dirt. Let's see some names of them. Skull and Bones. I don't know how well Starfield actually sold. Forspoken. Saints Row. Anthem. Gollum really wasn't a AAA game. It never was. Redfall. Uh, Diablo 4. It seems like nobody really gives a shit about it. I'm not sure if they made their money back on that or if it was like really good. Immortals of Avenum. Uh, that's another one for sure. Uh, I'm trying to think. Do we have one more? Marvel Avengers. Can we do one more? One more game. Wulong for sure. It was a double A game. Not triple A. Not really that big. I don't know. I, I would say like that's that's a good start, right? There's a lot of games. And so we think about like the collectively with all those games. You think about the billions of dollars that were wasted on those games. And then you turn around and look at some of these very, very small in comparison game studios that made games that vastly outweighed the price that they spent on the game. So, like, for example, you have games like, let's just go down some of the list. Uh, Deep Rock Survivor, this Galactic Survivor game. Like, this is a very, very simple, small game, and it seems like people really like it a lot, and there were a lot of people playing it. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, other, like, kind of smaller scale games, like Death Must Die. Small scale game, a lot of people played it, there it is. Uh, Grand Blue, I think, was pretty popular, to be fair. Um, you know, it was like an existing fan base, uh, etc., uh, Helldivers was fucking huge. Like, Helldivers is a really great example. Because Helldivers is like, that is the most recent example. But before Helldivers, there was Power World. And also Enshrouded that happened at the, ex the same time, which was kind of, uh, you know, unfortunate for them, considering how successful, uh, you know, Power World was. Uh, Last Epoch. Uh, look at, like, think about how much money was invested into Diablo 4 versus Last Epoch. And I understand that obviously this is still very early on with the, uh, I'm going to make sure I pull this up here, um, uh, with this. But let's let's look and see what which one is, is how, how things are doing on Steam, right? And I don't want you guys to look necessarily at, look at what happened with the season. Like the season barely even brought anyone back. And almost no one is playing Diablo 4. And I know that obviously most people are playing it on Battle.net. But the reality is that like Last Epoch really isn't having that kind of a massive drop-off in the same way that Diablo 4 is. So at a certain point, let's say that Last Epoch makes half as much money as Diablo 4. Like Last Epoch makes $50 million, Diablo 4 makes $100 million. Well, if Last Epoch takes... 5% or 10% of the money to make than Diablo 4, then which one is a better fucking investment here? Well, I would say Last Epoch is. So that's really what the difference is. Last Epoch is also $40. Yeah. Profit margins are miles apart. Diablo 4 made a billion in one week. Yes, it did make a... I think it did make a billion dollars in one week. But also, like, Diablo 4 is a live service game that how many people are working on that game every single month that it takes to just pay rent on all of those people and all of that infrastructure. So you're you're paying, like, I, I bet it probably costs more to pay for six months of live service of Diablo 4 than it would cost to make all of Last Epoch. And I would be, like, I'm kind of talking out of my ass here, to be completely honest with you, but, like, you see how massive these companies are and how big these teams are. The last Epoch team isn't anywhere near that. So, it sucks to suck, yeah. You're making an educated guess. I'm making the best educated guess based off of what I understand, which, to be fair, is, you know, kind of limited. But if somebody else wants to talk to me about this that knows more about it, I, I'd love to hear. Because I personally am seeing a lot of these double-A and single-A games outperforming especially in terms of return on investment because whenever you talk about return on investment um you know you you let's say you spend a hundred dollars and you get two hundred dollars that's a 100 percent roi right return on investment pretty simple I just want to make sure that we're like all on the same page here uh you can talk with pirate software about this yeah sure i'd love to i think that'd be good Someone in game that I say the reason why me and people are, are not playing Last Epoch right now is they're playing other games. If there weren't other games from the play, they'd be playing Last Epoch. Yeah, I, I definitely think so too. Uh, I I totally agree. I think that there's going to be a lot of people who 
will go back and play Last Epoch, even though they haven't played it right now. So, Azimut doesn't understand how much a billion dollars is, apparently. Um, what did I say? Sales, Diablo 4, reached a billion dollars. Okay, so like, alright, so think about it like this. Alright, so you're talking about like a billion dollars. How much is a billion dollars? Well, it's a thousand million dollars, right? It's pretty simple. So, how much did Diablo 4 take to make? I think that they put out that number, right? It was like hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Didn't they say it was like $600 million or something like that? I, I don't know if that was like really anything legit, but they spent probably up to $100 million on marketing alone. Not to make. I don't know. But I think that they spent a tremendous millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars on making this game. And are they really making their money back if you look at it percentage-wise? So, like, if you spend $200 million and you make $1 billion, you are going up 400%, right? But if you spend $1 million or $20 million and you make $200 million, you're going up, like, fucking 10x. So I think that the problem is that studios have been focusing on making these massive blockbuster games. And the process of making these massive blockbuster games is such a huge investment. And I think that also didn't... Uh, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. So as part of the layoff, um, Sony canceled a Twisted Metal live service game. Live service games are some of the most expensive games to make because they require a constant development team on staff. Like, for example, think about if you make Elden Ring and after, after they make the Erd Tree DLC, think about how many people are going to be actively working on Elden Ring anymore at From Software. Basically fucking nobody. Like, maybe a handful of people that do customer service and, like, you know, just occasional balancing changes, but basically nobody. But the problem with live service is that you are basically attaching yourself, marrying yourself to this game, and the continual success of this game. So yeah, Sony sees that a lot of people aren't really liking live service games. And I actually don't think that's true. I think people aren't liking bad live service games. That's why Helldivers 2 is so popular. And also, Last Epoch is popular. That's a live service game too. Do people really care about that? I don't think so. I think they really care about having games that just have bad quality. So, I think this is really kind of a reevaluation that I think these gaming companies are going to make in terms of what is the value of investing a hundred million dollars just on development of a video game whenever there are so many massive duds. Because this is what, like, for example, a lot of like venture capitalist firms do is that they give money to basically everybody, and then if they hit one or two shots in like a hundred, they make all of their money back. And then the money they don't make back, they write off their taxes as a loss. So it's a little, you know, a cute little system that they've got going on there. So that's what I think is gonna happen. Same thing I've seen in film industry too. Yeah, uh, basically you're, you're gonna see, I think these studios moving away from making these blockbuster games outside of like the big, big, big games like God of War, whatever Elden Ring 2 is going to be, um, Death Stranding 2, Red Dead Redemption, Grand Theft Auto 6. Like, these are going to be like, these are the massive, massive, massive games that are not going to stop. But I think that they're going to stop a lot of the idea of trying to pursue being that next big game. And I think that the success of so many breakout hits like Power World, Entrouded, uh, Last Epoch, Helldivers 2 from studios that aren't AAA and how massively successful that was, I think that's totally shaken up the industry. And it's caused a lot of these larger studios to ask themselves, why are we investing hundreds of millions of dollars into a game that could completely fail? Because also think about it. So like, let's say Immortals of Avenum. Let, let's think about that game, right? That game, how much was that game to make? I think they said $150 million, right? I just want to make sure that we're starting at the, the first, at a number. $125 million. Okay, good. So let's talk about $125 million. How much money do you think that game made?
I think probably 10 to 10 to 30 million dollars, right? Probably like 10 to 30 million dollars, somewhere around there. And I think also 30 million is probably very, very, very high. I wouldn't expect it to have been made even that much money. So they basically took, and somebody said, I don't understand what a billion is. I do. I remember watching the Recful video. We all watched it back 10 years ago. They took one tenth of a billion dollars and they lit it on fire. Think about how massive of a loss that is. That is such an astronomical loss that you can't even imagine. Like that that's the reason. Like you think about how much is a hundred million dollars. Well, <laughs> how many people could you pay if you looked at people getting paid a hundred thousand dollars? That's literally hundreds of people that are being paid. What is that? Hundred million? Um yeah, that would be a thousand people. You'd have a thousand people, you could pay a hundred thousand dollars. That is crazy. Or two CEOs. Yeah, exactly. You have no idea how much they spent on anything. All we know is what they made. And uh, they made a billion dollars a year ago. Um, I'm talking about Immortals of Avenum, And they did say how much money they spent on that game. And I think that it's very easy to assume that they didn't make a lot of money off of it. Because nobody's playing the game. I don't really think this is a massive assumption for me to make. That a game that nobody is playing isn't making a lot of money. Like, I, I don't know. I, I think that's pretty reasonable. People are playing it again. Check Steam charts. It's going up. Uh, probably because so many people are talking about it, right? But I don't think that, like, even if it goes up slightly, think about how much it has to go up and how much it would have to succeed in order for them to make that money back. And also, yeah, they said that it was a failure. So it's not like I'm tell I'm, I'm not I'm not making an assumption here. I'm agreeing with them. I agree with Diablo 4, they don't want us to know how much they made with the store, and they probably make their money back in two to three weeks of release on the store alone. There is a big reason, like, if I was a developer, I would probably want to add in microtransactions in one way or another. But at the same time, uh, I think that some games, it's just antithetical to what the game is. And I think that some developers don't understand that, and they don't respect that. There's 24 people playing it? Yeah, I don't really think that's going up by a whole lot, right? They may profit after release, but if nobody plays it, the running costs will eat into it. Yeah. And so, like, this is kind of how I think it's 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 going to go, right? With a, a game like Diablo 4. And this is what's problematic, right? So you have... This is, I guess... Let me think of a way to put this. Uh, money. And then you have time, right? And so you obviously have the launch of a game. And so at the launch of the game, you have zero dollars, and then the launch you go up massively. And then over time, and then you add in little things into the store, you know, little things like that. But you are still going to be making less money over time. And this is the life of Diablo 4. That's basically what happens. And so because you do have the operating expenses of the game, and the operating expenses of the game are relatively similar regardless. Like, you need to have customer service. You need to have people developing new seasons. Now, you're going to cut back on that, but whenever you cut back on development, then that makes this black line above it go down even faster. So it's like the more you cut down on development, the more you have to cut down on development because people are receiving a lower product. So eventually, what ends up happening is you have like the monthly income and the monthly revenue that this game generates becomes lower than the operating costs. And that's whenever they make the expansion, I think. They make the expansion at that point, and then they get that massive surge again, and then they go back down the line. But the problem is that, and I think this is the way that almost all live service games work, but the difference is that a good live service game, this line will go down much more slowly. Then they take 100 uh, years to make Diablo 4. Yeah, it took way too long. I don't think that's true, right? Came out and said League of Legends runs on whales money. I don't think it's outside of the normal possibility that whale money also exists in Diablo 4, just like how it exists in Diablo Immortal. I don't know exactly like how... Well, also like the League business model... Well, so I, I disagree with you. So the League business model, you're not buying a video game. So like the entire value proposition of the game is totally different. 
So it could only be possible that the game would exist on Whale's money because you are not purchasing a video game. So, and I think also with Diablo Immortal, it's the same thing. It's a free video game. I'm talking about this is what happens with like buy to play live service games. And I think that more and more people are starting to see that like a lot of these live service games, there's like, in my opinion, and I feel this way about battle passes, there's like a cap on like how many battle passes and how many games do you want to maintain at any given time? Because like how many of you guys, you're like, you have a quota, I guess, in your mind of like, okay, I'm going to play, you know, three live service games at a time. And if I stop playing this game, I'm going to play another game. But if I don't play it, then I'll play something new. Two max, right? I can do like two. Yeah, and that's what happens. So like, for example, whenever I finish Grand Blue, which isn't really a live service game, but it's close to a live service game, right? It, it is and it's not because it's receiving updates. Then I'm going to go back and play Weathering Waves more. So, like, what happens is that all of these games are competing for such a limited amount of time that a person has. And if you're not playing the game regularly, and I'm talking about this is like an off-stream casual game that I'm playing on my free time. Obviously, it doesn't mean I'm going to play Weathering Waves on stream every day. I'm just talking about it in the same way, like, I'm not playing Grand Blue every day on stream. Well, I am, but I'm not playing it. Uh, the game's playing itself. So, I'm saying, like, on a personal level. Can you explain what a live service game is? Live service game? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. For anybody who doesn't really understand. Live service games are games that continuously get update, that continuously get updates after the game is released in a consecutive and consistent and substantial way. So, for example, like a new season for a game uh, or new balancing patches regularly for something like League of Legends. Uh, but, like, and you contrast that with something like Baldur's Gate, which doesn't really get live service updates. It receives updates to the game, and they're improving the game over time, which is crazy that they're doing that, but it's not really a formal live service game uh, in the same way. Like, Elden Ring is not a live service game. Armored Core 6 is not a live service game, even though they do make updates to the game. I think live service games is a game a live service. If a game has a battle pass, it's probably a live service. That's a pretty good way to say it. Yeah, all MMOs are live service games. Yeah, usually always online. Yeah, yeah, because it's like it makes sense, right? You've got to have a live service. It's an online game. It's got to be live. You know, it is what it is. Live service equals money. Yeah, basically, the more ways that you can spend money on a game, the higher the chances that it's a live service game.